Good morning. I, we've got a little bit of a light crowd, so hopefully we have some people f funnel in. Um, but if not, I figure uh, we'll get started here in just a moment. Uh, but I'll give you a little background on, on myself and uh, what we're going to talk about today. So my name's Sean Wilson. I'm the Senior Product Marketing Manager for Skype for Business. I own deployment, uh, manageability, interop, and the IT Pro story all up. Uh, my background before I came to marketing is I actually ran Link internally for us at Microsoft for three and a half years. And so I owned core and conferencing and all those nightmares and headaches that comes with it. Um, but also the, the ability to enable uh, my users to be able to communicate anywhere in the world. So my, my uh, conversation today is about that, that journey to the cloud and what that journey looks like and some of our key things. I'm really, uh, today I'm gonna talk really about four pillars. The first one is really what Skype across devices means uh, and what that familiar experience, some of our transitions has really driven us to. Uh, I will talk about our complete meeting solution uh, end to end what that looks like and what that means. I'll also be talking a little bit about modern voice. Uh, I've got a session tomorrow afternoon that's specific on cloud PBX deployments and planning and that one's a much deeper dive into Cloud PBX. And then also talk a little bit about operator services and, when I, and, and the Microsoft services. And with this one, uh, not only talk about the telco and pieces there, but really also talk about some of the things that we're delivering within the cloud uh, that create a unique uh, opportunity for, for customers and partners alike. But let's talk a little bit about our journey. So how many people in here have been along the very uh, the varied journey from OCS to Skype or Link to Skype throughout that journey. Okay, so we've got a little bit of a balance. One of the reasons that I asked that question is our journey started over a decade ago when we acquired Placeware. And we had LCS, we had Placeware, we moved that into live meeting, and then we came out with OCS R2 in 2007. And the, the fundamental journey that we've had was really about how do we have technology enable people to communicate and do their work wherever they are, however they want to do it. But as we took that journey along the way, one of the things that we learned was that focusing on technology to enable users rather than focusing on users uh, to, to build and, and bring those, those solutions and applications uh, to the forefront was really a transition that we made when we decided we were gonna make that transition from Link to Skype. And uh, about a year and a half ago, oh, about a year and a half ago, we actually made that uh, transition uh, in April of 2015. And that transition was we had seen that we had over 300 million users using Skype every day. We had unparalleled insights into how people worked we also saw that three billion minutes of voice and video a day across the Skype network gave us unparalleled insights to how people worked. And so what this really started to, to set the stage for was a complete meeting solution, complete cloud communications that really enable everything from audio and video conferencing to web conferencing to co-authoring, integration within Office 365, the ability to have telephony integrated not only on-prem but into the cloud. And what does that mean as we move forward? And I'll talk a little bit today about where people are going from on-prem to hybrid to cloud and what that looks like and how they can take advantage of some of those services within Skype for Business. But the other piece to this is that it's not just about web conferencing or audio conferencing. It's not just about telephony. It's not about I am in presence. It's about a single integrated solution that enables people to meet how they want to meet, when they want to meet, and where they want to meet. So let's talk a little bit about some of that, that core innovation that we talk about. So it's built on Skype and Link. We know Skype is doing uh, a third of all long distance around the world for telephony long distance. Okay. We understand voice and video unlike anybody else. Link has had a long history in the enterprise of manageability and the ability to not only give IT the control that they need, but also the, the confidence and the security that's there. We also 
with Skype for Business Online, we are globally available. The, Sky, the, the Microsoft network provides over 1.4 million miles of fiber. Okay? Uh, we are global in an essence that no other cloud communications provider can talk to, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Specifically, we launched in December of 2015, we launched our uh, PSTN and, and the conferencing and calling services. And our conferencing, just to give us a, a scenario, we were in 40 countries. And in a year, we're in over 90 countries with 400 different dial-in cities. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. But really, the cloud enables us to do something that is unfathomed historically, and that is continuous innovation. And it actually was brought forth to us by mobile, right? If you think of how mobile devices and applications uh, have changed the expectations of users to be able to have a new feature on a weekly or monthly or quarterly basis versus every three years. And so this, the cloud enables us to bring continuous innovation going forward. But it's not about the feature or the functionality. It's about people connecting. And it's about how people connect. It might be that they're all sitting on their mobile devices. Somebody might be traveling. Somebody might be sitting in their, on their Mac or on their PC or in a conference room or in a huddle space. And one of the core premise behind everything that we decided to do was that we chose that we were not going to focus on feature and functionality as much as we were on bringing that user experience that was familiar to users. And so one of the tests that we did was when we originally decided, hey, we're going to go down this path of moving from Link 2013 to Skype for Business user experience, was we wanted to know what the feedback was on going to that familiar UX. And so in blind studies, we ended up having a 92% preferred rate of people using it because they were familiar with it. I ask in my executive briefings the oldest and the youngest that people have, have seen and know people using Skype. And if anybody can beat the numbers in the room, I'm at 92 years old and 17 months. Okay? And if you think about it, the 17 months old recognizes grandma and recognizes the green button and means that she's going to be able to see grandma. And the 92 year old realizes that it doesn't take anything to understand the general functions. The same look and feel that we're used to and experiencing not only within Skype, but also within a lot of our applications. So as we look at this, it's not just about that user experience. It's also about that full integration into Office 365. If I'm sitting in a uh, Word Online doc and having my, my web browser with my full contact list and my ability to see that somebody happens to be in, a conver or be in the document, I can start an IM conversation with them from right there. My ability to have a full, rich experience in mobile, and we'll talk a little bit more about mobile in just a second, as well as those rich clients, and then even going into the conference room. So if you think about how we at Microsoft have looked at letting people connect, it's about letting people connect how they want to, where they want to, on the device of their choice. And so a lot of this innovation that we're coming forth with, we'll talk a little bit more about, is about enabling your experience regardless of where you are. So, I'm going to talk about a couple of experiences. I'm not going to dive into the specific client ones, but I want to talk a little bit about Mac. Skype for Business Mac was a, was the, a, a new mindset for us. And it was in, we had Link for Mac. Did anybody here use Link for Mac? Or had to at one point? And was, yeah. So Link for Mac was, had challenges, and challenges as being polite. And we looked at it and said, OK, we need to go and come up with a brand new code base that rethinks how we actually look at client development. We want to look at the most current codex. We want to look at a brand new code base, which is why Skype for Business Mac took so much longer to bring out than it did on the PC, because we rethought it from the ground up. The other pieces to it is things like the full bleed video. One of the things you'll notice here at the end, or, or you'll see, is that at the bottom and top, it actually uses black. Now, this is just like a little tidbit that I like to share, but it uses black, and the reason it uses black is because our mind has been taught to ignore the black by the film industry. 
We don't see the black bars at the top and bottom. If you look at, it, at, at any of our other clients, it was dark blue. And we were going to do the dark blue so that we consistently kept with brand. And that was the feedback we got. You'll also see full bleed video to use up as much space as possible. This is the innovation that we continue to strive for to focus on, on user experience. One of the challenges that's happened is that in IT, we have a tendency, historically, to find a solution that meets a feature need and roll that out. And the challenge is there is too many options now for users to go and find their own solutions. And so being forefront to make sure that we focus on things like adoption and focusing on ease of use and usability is key. But as we look at that, you also have to think, what is the one thing that every single person in this room has in common right now? Every single person is carrying at least one mobile device, right? So if you look at our continued innovation, or constant innovation that we're driving, and this is just through the end of the year, so this is, and this isn't even a, cons uh, a, a complete list, but mobile platforms give you two things. One, they give you an opportunity for continuous innovation. Great example is the bottom right corner here is the iOS uh, call kit integration, or that seamless experience that doesn't interrupt your calls, because it's Skype for Business is actually integrated directly into your iPhone experience and coming with Android as well. Some of the other pieces that are key there is as, as you move back and forth between your mobile device and your, um, oh wait, just a moment. Uh, as you move from your mobile device into your rich client and back and forth, historically there was this disparate conversation history. I had one on my mobile device, I had one on my computer and they weren't tied together. Well, earlier this last year was the, the real core behind it was for us to integrate that server side conversation history. Okay? So that when I pick up my phone and I have a conversation with Anthony and I send him a message, that it's also sitting on my rich client. And so that when I go and I have that conversation because I'm on the plane and then I get back to my desk or I get to the hotel and I want to continue the conversation and I don't want to be like this on my phone and I'd rather actually have a rich conversation, I still have that experience there. So the continued innovation that we're bringing into that, the ability to upload a PowerPoint directly into a meeting from a mobile device, I never actually thought that would be important until I was stuck with only a mobile device and having to host a meeting. And so we change our paradigm as we start to look at how people work and how innovation happens. How many people here are responsible for conference rooms? How many people in this room have tried to pass off that onus? Okay. So my background was I owned conferencing at Microsoft internally for Microsoft IT. Before that, I'd been a video conferencing service provider. I understand the complexities of the conference room and the challenges there. One of the things that we actually launched at Ignite and, and have actually uh, started shipping with our first partner is the next generation of Skype room systems. Imagine at the center of a room, full touch control of a meeting, simple user interface with the capability to share content, join meeting, vo high definition voice and video. Our first partner in this was uh, Logitech. We've got Crestron and Polycom coming on later this year. Um, and I'll talk more about the specific experience, but imagine walking into a conference room and not trying to figure out how to make it work. How many people here open up their phone, go searching for the call and the pin ID so they can dial it in? You guys have all seen that video conference in real life thing, right? Yeah, we all live that experience, and this is one of those things. Honestly, I watch an exec walk into our room, start a meeting, and actually presenting in under a minute, and didn't have help. And that was one of the, that was where I realized that we had hit the right mark for this. And the price point on these is amazing because it starts at sub two thousand bucks. Service Hub. How many people here have seen or played with the Service Hub? Okay, probably about fifty percent. So Service Hub is a is a new collaboration, I won't even say concept, it's, it, think of the ability to have a team truly be able to collaborate at the front of a room with a rich Windows 10 experience with pen and ink and touch 
and 4K and the ability to truly collaborate as a team. However, as we know, teams are global. No more do we all sit in one building somewhere. More than, I believe Gardner said, by the end of 2017, 80% of the workforce will spend at least 5% of their work off-site, remote, okay? Well, if that's the case, then that means that you've got somebody that's not gonna be there. One of the things that we did was we natively integrated Skype for Business into the Surface Hub. Now people ask, well, is this, what's, what's the role or the use for this? The Surface Hub is a collaboration team device that just extends that power of bringing the group into the conference room. So as we start to think a lot about Skype across devices, it's about how we meet and how we communicate, right? So we communicate text, I am, voice, not as much anymore, you know, the, the text seems to be replacing that. You know, we, it, asynchronous persistent chat, things that are there, voice, video, it might even be comments in a document, okay? But one of the key pieces was that when we launched our PSTN conferencing into the market, and we brought some key things into Skype for Business Online, it really enabled customers to truly consider a cloud solution as their complete meeting solution, okay? Now, it could be from ad hoc to scheduled meetings. So, one of the questions I have is, how do we meet? Right, I just gave you some examples, but it might be in a conference room, it might be huddled together. It could be something where you're, you've all done this, right? Where you have the conference call and you're all sitting in front of the one computer huddled in the room. Or more importantly, my favorite one for this one is we're all working on the same document, but it's easier for us to sit there together, right? You've got the individual contributor, my personal favorite, typically seven o'clock in the morning, getting ready, trying to have a conference call, you know, joining meetings from the plane. Um, but also the ability for us to broadcast and share information across. We don't meet the way we used to. So if you think about what Skype for Business is, as, a, as a complete meeting solution truly offers, at the core of it is an online meeting, okay? It is our ability to connect via audio, video, content sharing, PowerPoint sharing with annotation co-authoring of documents while live in a voice and video call? How many people here have done that whole conversation where they're on a, uh, they're working on a document with somebody remote? I expect every hand in the room, okay? How many of you have done the whole, no, 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 not that line, no, no, two down, can you, can you change that one up a little bit? It, that same experience is what drives all of us crazy and it impacts productivity, okay? Well, Skype for Business, because it's part of Office 365, has integration into the co-authoring capabilities directly from a Skype for Business meeting. The integration of OneNote directly into a meeting to incorporate every single element of that meeting invite, who was invited, did they attend, any of the attachments, okay? But all those pieces are great, but what happens when you have somebody that isn't sitting at a computer or has access to a data network. Well, one of the biggest pieces we were able to deliver earlier this year, or I guess last year, and continue to deliver on is PSTN conferencing. Uh, how many people, I'm gonna assume everybody in here has some form of PSTN conferencing. How many of you are responsible for more than one audio conferencing provider? How many of you think that procurement would be much happier having only one, right? Um, that's my one comment. I, if I walk into a briefing with somebody and there's somebody from procurement, anything that can simplify their lives. So we'll talk a little bit more about that PSTN conferencing and the ability to dial in and dial out and have 800 number toll free dial in, which by the way, we've all taken for granted because we've always had access to our PIN. The fundamental thing we saw actually at Microsoft was we saw our PSTN conferencing almost bottom out when we went to online meetings because we realized that people would actually in, use the click to join functionality rather than dialing in because it was faster. They didn't have to fumble through their phone and figure out the pin. 
it does require a little change management, right? It requires a different frame of thought. But to that, one of the things that we also then bring is, hey, how do I get information out to the masses, right? Um, you know, multicasting technologies and uh, enterprise video deployment solutions that are either uh, like purchased like a, like a VBrick or, or something that's a service like an ON24, these types of solutions are services that, that, and solutions that tend to remain dormant for very long periods of time and then get a boost because you have a town hall or a company meeting. In Skype for Business Online, in E1, you have the capability to broadcast to up to 10,000 users. It, they can be authenticated within your company or as my colleague Jamie and I do every two weeks with our, with our other colleagues, we actually broadcast out to all of the IT pro communities that are out there on whatever the topic might be. Last week it was on Skype Operations Framework. Next week it'll be on the advanced analytics and CQD and some of the key things that Microsoft IT has done to really look at root cause analysis. So it gives us an opportunity to now take something that once I could have implemented and then sat dormant for you know, 320 days a year because it required somebody to manage and maintain or I can use the elasticity of Azure and be able to scale up to 10,000 people when I need it directly from my Skype for Business client. And then when I'm done, I'm not having to worry about those resources. And in addition to that, we've got Skype room systems. We talked a little bit about that and I'll show you a little bit more about what they look and what that experience looks like kind of going forward. So as I was talking about Skype meeting broadcast, I want to kind of get into this one just a little bit. Because what we did is we understood that the Azure Content Delivery Network, the same one that delivered the Olympics to millions of people, gave us a platform to deliver globally a broadcast solution that didn't require customers to go and invest in advanced networking capabilities like multicast or the capability to go and store an enterprise video deployment system. And so we were able to take that Skype for business experience sitting within the client and set it up as a broadcast so that any user could use it. Okay? And then what that does is that ports into Azure Media Services and is delivered around the world without ever having to think about the challenges that are faced with making sure that you can reach anywhere in the world from Azure. Now, one of the things I wanted to, to say, that's the one-to-many solution. How many people in here have traditional video conferencing in, in your ecosystem? Okay. This is one of the largest pain points for people that it, it's been a blocker for people for many years. And the reason was is because you had disparate systems in conference rooms that either were, you have a telephone and a display here, you have a video conference here, you have telepresence there, and I might have, telepre I might have video conferencing from one provider, telepresence from another, and what ended up happening was you then had to go and look at a third party to build some form of virtual meeting room solution that you could all join, right? Well, what we actually did is, with our first partner, with Polycom, we actually are building a cloud video interop, video interop service in Office 365. Now, what does this mean? Well, historically, you talked about video interop, and it was, hey, I can make video work between my Skype network, my Skype for Business ecosystem and video conferencing. Except, what did I say online meetings were all about? They're about they're about voice, video, and content, right? And if any of you have ever worked with Microsoft, content is king. Um, we believe internally that a great way to convey information is about 3,000 words on a slide, right? So um, we love our PowerPoint, we love content, and content adds a level of, um, it magnifies the level of conversation and collaboration and communication you're having because you're able to share concepts and thoughts that might not be heard or seen. 
in a voice and video conversation. And so what the cloud video interrupt solution allows us to do is take voice and video and content and fully share it across not only the video conferencing endpoints, but also Skype for Business. Now, if we talk about that meeting portfolio and we talk about the, the um, cloud, the, the challenges with doing this, VTC engineering is a unique science. It's one that, that a lot of customers and a lot of partners spend a lot of time investing in. And we realize that our ability to add, build this as an add-on in Office 365 for you to be able to have any of your VTC endpoints join a Skype for Business meeting seamlessly was, uh, for us, paramount. But it's not just about that. Remember I just talked a little bit about Skype room systems, right? It's about connecting every room. If we take a look at what's happening in the industry right now for space, and you talk to real estate and facilities, historically a conference room was rectangle. It held anywhere from six to 20 people, and it had a telephone in the, in the middle, and it had a display at the front. About 2.5% of conference rooms in the world currently have video conferencing or video capabilities in them. That leaves over 97% of conference rooms that have that display and a speakerphone. And some don't even have the display. One of the things behind our premise was we wanted to give you an enterprise grade experience that was user friendly, that could adapt to the space in the room that you needed. And so one of the biggest pieces we did is we identified three key partners. The first is Logitech, and they came out with the Logitech Smart Dock. And with that dock, it gave you the ability to plug into your display and use any of the Skype for Business peripherals or the ones that they actually have bundled with their product to be able to enable the space that you want to be in. Okay? So the ability to deal with a 20-person conference room is going to require that you have a camera that can pan, tilt, zoom. But if I'm in a huddle space that requires space for 10 people or two people, I'm going to have a very different requirement. So the ability to have a variety of those endpoints was key. Now, one of the things for us was when we looked at this and we looked to see what were the key pieces that were there, were we needed to make sure that people could use their existing space, they could procure it from the channels they already procure it and not necessarily have to go find an AV integrator to go and do massive work in their existing conferencing space. Okay? Um, and so as we look at this, it was really a dedicated, it's a, it's a Surface Pro 4 in a dedicated dock that has the ability for video ingest, so it means I can plug my tablet directly into the dock and it automatically projects in the room. And if I'm in a Skype for Business meeting, automatically shows up as sharing content in that meeting. How many times do we join a Skype for Business meeting or any meeting for that matter and we're not sure we're sharing the right screen? or the right information, right? And so it really was, hey, let's remove that, th those challenges. Um, and because it integrates with our existing investments. It's available right now. Uh, we will actually also have Crestron and Polycom later this year that are shipping. And you can actually go to the office, the products.office.com and look at the Skype room systems. There's a whole thing on the portfolios and where they go if you wanted to take a look more in depth. Now, some of the things that are key in this is that there's our existing link room systems, right? And our existing link room systems that were out there, or Skype room systems, typically had two displays. So multi-display support is coming. It's one of our, our North Stars to go to, hopefully the end of this year. As well, because it's a Windows 10 machine, it already has the native uh, sharing capability for wireless projection. It's a matter of building that into the universal apps. And finally, really, is to uh, allow for customization. And that one will probably be our farther out end of 2017, early 2018. So if you're a company and you want your own logo there, right? Now, remember I talked about that broadcast thing? I talked about putting it in Azure. How many people here are an international company? 
One of the number and challenges that, our, that people face is when I go to broadcast, I have to take into account a couple of different things. One, I have to take into account different languages. I have to take into account the message that I'm delivering can actually be consumed by everybody in the room. And so we actually, using Azure and using our intelligent cloud, actually transcribe and translate live broadcasts. Now, Anthony was telling me that he was back looking at our Ignite video where my colleague Jamie and I were doing our broadcast and he said that it had actually, we had turned on transcription. I didn't actually look to watch the transcription, but he said it was, it was pretty much dead on accurate. Now it has a couple of different things where it will say, my name is John, not Sean. But that's, that's the evolution of what AI and intelligent cloud brings. But my question is, what if you can deliver this in 50 languages? And oh, by the way, it's included with your Skype for Business. You're not having to go and pay an additional transcription service. The, the, initially, it'll be, you'll be able to deliver it in four languages. So English, Spanish, German, and Mandarin. And it'll send out the transcriptions in over 50 languages. Klingon being one of them, by the way. And if you ever want to, if you want to see it for, for the fun, uh, the Ignite presentation, same title as this one, it's a little more demo heavy, but they actually do the transcription translation with Klingon with uh, Kirk Konigsbauer doing his, uh, his keynote. So it's a lot of fun. Um, when we talk about meetings, I'm just going to take a poll of the room because I do this and everybody asks, how many people here have some form of link? How many have Skype for Business server? How many have Skype for Business online? Okay, so I'm gonna ask the same question then, and I'm gonna probably see the same hands. How many of you are set up in hybrid? <laughs> um, so one of the biggest things that Office 365 brings, specifically in the meeting space, is that, remember I talked about the continued innovation? Well, if I had Link 2010, I don't get to take advantage of HD video in the video gallery like I did in 2013. But if I happen to go to 2013, I don't, if I'm in 20, link 2013 and I haven't moved to Skype for Business or Skype for Business Online, I don't get to take advantage of video-based screen sharing, which is the, one of the newest improvements that we made in the client, server, and service to improve the screen sharing experience. Because one of the challenges, anybody here that's run it, and most of you have, is that you understand that the, re, the uh, experience with the RDP-based screen sharing is yes, it gives you a lot of control and a lot of manageability back and forth, but that initial session setup, this is where we continue to innovate, okay? We continue to bring things into this experience. One of the things we're actually doing, and I'll talk a little bit more, you'll see it there, is, is what does it mean for multinational corporations? I saw a large group of hands saying that they were multinational. And, and anybody, I go back to my favorite topic, VTC. But if anybody thinks about it, the, when I was doing it, the, uh, the high level engineers that we were looking for were scarce. And I'm assuming they're even more scarce today. And so being able to rely on a service to do the heavy lifting for the engineering for your VTC interop to Skype for Business is paramount. But the, the big one that, that I want us to remember is where innovation comes and how we take advantage of it. I'm not saying hashtag forklift your entire on-prem ecosystem. I'll talk about how to make that migration and what that looks like going forward because there is a journey to the cloud. It is, the cloud is ready, but your enterprise has unique and individual pieces to it that will help you determine your speed to the cloud. So let's talk a little bit about voice. How many people in here are telephony people? Okay, good, I got four, excellent. <laughs> Five, <laughs> okay. Um, so let's talk about what we consider, think about from modern voice. So cloud PBX is the core PBX functionality that we put into Skype for Business online in December of a year ago. So if you think about it, it is the true core functionality that PBX would do. This is not your PSTN connectivity. 
This is, this is not your ability to dial out to your sister or receive a call. It is the call controls and call functionality within Skype for Business Online. And this is included in E5. It can also be bought as an add-on. Now, when I talk to customers about Cloud PBX, a lot of them say, hey, you know, I'm not necessarily ready to go to the cloud for my PBX. And the reason is, is that the typical PBX uh, or telephony project has a lifespan of five to seven, sometimes upwards of 10 years for certain companies. And so when you think about it, we're gonna talk a little bit about how you think about planning for voice and where these opportunities truly can, can approach because giving you the capability to use existing circuits and investments with the online cloud is, is, is key. Or in, in some cases where you might have a merger and acquisition, it might be an opportunity for you to not have to go and deploy another PBX and be able to take advantage of the, the capabilities that we're able to deliver from the cloud. So, person to person calling, right? We all get this core function of not only Skype for business, but also for the core function of a PBX. My ability as a private branch exchange is to reach other people within my organization as well connect outbound. And so that next piece, which really comes into um, the two ways that we connect, is you can buy PSTN calling services from Microsoft, integrated directly into your Office 365 tenant. And tomorrow, during my Plan Your Cloud PBX deployment session, I'm actually gonna demo how to acquire and provision numbers, set up call queues, because I think one of the biggest challenges, I only saw five hands for telephony, but if you go to most companies and ask how long does it take for a new employee to get set up with a phone and a phone number and getting coordinated, it'll typically range anywhere from 48 hours to upwards of a week, depending on the organization. Okay. And so what I wanna do is be able to show you how using Cloud PBX and our provisioning, how simple that can be and be integrated right into your automated processes for, from HR systems. But then there's another piece to this, which is, hey, I got my own carrier. I've got a contract that's gonna last three more years. I don't wanna have to go and replace that. I've also got users that, that still want a phone and stay on the system they are, but I've got other users I wanna move to the cloud. How do I take advantage of that? And so we'll talk a little bit about that in just a second. The first one, going back to that PSTN calling service, is that it's an add-on to your cloud PBX. But Microsoft, in December of 2015, became a telco. And as a telco, we provide phone numbers, the ability for, and now we're, we started in the US, we're now in the US, the UK, Puerto Rico, France, and in preview in Spain. And we'll continue to grow those as we go, okay? But one of the, one of the biggest pieces to this is at us as a telephony provider means that it reduces a lot of the complexity of A, managing multiple contracts, if you can. The other piece is, is provisioning and integration directly into your Office 365 system, which by the way, if you're already setting them up for Exchange Online and you're setting them up in Office 365, it's just another element of the workload to add on and to provision. We have the capability that you can have domestic or international plans, right? So you customize it based on what your needs are across the board. Now, one of the advantages is that because we're built on, you know, on the Office 365 platform, but also really Skype for Business Online, is that there is the integration, the ability to do bulk assignment with PowerShell. We also have the ability for you to port your numbers. And so you can do self-service porting. If it's a small number, you can use our services to help you port large blocks of numbers, okay? So we took a look at this and said, hey, if you wanna come to Microsoft, we've gotta be able to handle all of these key pieces. And so that's, that's really, uh, really core for us was 
being able to provide those numbers. As well, one of the things is, is the ability for us to provide 800 numbers, right? So let's think, I wanna be able to call into an office, what does that look like? And so we'll talk a little bit about, uh, uh, tomorrow we'll talk a little bit about or, or organizational auto attendance as well as call queues and what that looks like and what's coming. Um, but really, it comes down to how we meet. And I wanna go back to this. If I look at how I work in a day, I wake up in the morning, I look at my email, because you know, that's what we do, and I see that I've got a conversation with somebody that I need to have that ping me from Europe overnight, and I see they're green, and so I start an IM conversation with them, and you know, three lines later, I'm like, this is just not going as fast as I want. So what do I do? I call them, and directly from the client. And if they're, if they're not available, I have the availability, because it's integrated with Azure AD, it's integrated with the, with uh, Exchange Online, I'm able to also see that they put their mobile number in the gal, and directly from Skype for Business, I can call them on their mobile. And then we have a quick conversation. If we need to, we can escalate it to a screen share to talk about the document they wanted to talk about. Then I go and join all of my scheduled meetings that I do during the day. But on average, I don't know what the average is today, but a number of years ago, they said the average person receives 38 to 65, or 30 to 65 emails a day. I don't know, you guys are lucky, because at Microsoft Mind's probably close to 220 to 300. Um, and the, the response rate, I think, is somewhere in the 10% range, like the number of ones you reply to. So having the ability to get in touch with someone very quickly to answer something that increases productivity is key. And so our core is, any of the stuff we're gonna do is to make people be more accessible faster in the way they wanna work. So let's talk a little bit about, hey, I got my own carrier. Great, I don't wanna use Microsoft as my carrier. I've got you know, Verizon or AT&T or, or Bell or whomever, and I've got an existing contract. Now I saw everybody raise their hands in here, majority, that had some form of link or some form of Skype for business. Well, if you have that, great, you can actually connect your Office 365 environment, and I saw a bunch of you raise your hands that you were hybrid, and telephony, the guy in the back here. And one of the key things with that is that I can then use that on-prem PSTN connectivity connected to my Skype for Business server with my users that I move to the cloud. Now, that's great. What if I don't have Skype for Business? Or I have OCS. Anybody in the room have OCS? Oh, thank you. Oh, we got one. Okay, two, maybe two. Um, but if I've got that, or I've got Link 2010 and they're using it for IAM and Presence, I have the capability to migrate those users to the cloud and then deploy Cloud Connector Edition instead of going and connecting my Skype for Business or Link 2013 ecosystem to my telephony network. And what Cloud Connector Edition is, is think of it as the race car. Think of it as it's stripped down to the core pieces you need to run voice efficiently at a virtual machine level that we give you those VMs and you have the capability to deploy and connect directly to your circuits because to either your SBCs or your gateways or even connect it to your existing phone systems. Because we know that you're not gonna go from zero to hero in the cloud voice space overnight. It's a journey. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about how you plan for that in just a minute. Because one of the hardest parts to planning your deployment is understanding your user growth and development. So remember I asked you what your status was. Don't worry about taking this photo. The deck will be available afterwards, okay? But as you see from left to right, I'm gonna kind of stand over here. A lot of the key value and functionality as you move forward still continues. But when you get to the cloud, you get to realize some of the key benefits that you might not in earlier versions. So as you take a look at, hey, what's my migration path? Take a look at this and say, hey, what are the things that I wanna do? Do I wanna make people more productive? Or do I really wanna simplify my procurement? 
it might be that you're, you're getting a lot of pressure from procurement to say, look, we've got lots of overhead and we've got lots of, of things to do to, to consolidate our billing. One of the things that we did at Microsoft was we actually had 13 people doing billing for telephony prior to Link 2013 Skype for Business. We have now moved it down to one body that is responsible for all of that and a couple of vendors that help out with the actual sorting of the, the payments because we do things like cross-charge to back to business. Simplifying procurement is key. If you happen to be using WebEx and you have a certain number of organizers and you're paying those telephony minutes on top of that, you might not be getting your best benefit out of it. One of the big things with Microsoft as the PSTN conferencing provider is it's flat rate, all you can eat for outbound dial or inbound dialing. So if you're paying on a per cent or a per minute basis, might not be the right, the, the right thing. If you've got procurement that says, hey, I'm in 10 countries and I've got six audio conferencing providers and I try to reconcile it and I don't know what it is, We've actually had customers come back to us and say, look, we actually save more on the PSTN conferencing because it's flat rate from, because we're not having to manage across five or six different providers. Okay. So as Microsoft and thinking about us as an operator and the services we provide is more than just PSTN conferencing, PSTN calling, and those pieces. One of the biggest uh, hurdles that people have is when I move to the cloud, I give up some of my control. We've been in IT for a long time. We like our control. We like knowing exactly what's gonna happen where. But the cloud really gives us three key pieces, okay? The Microsoft Cloud is hyperscale. It gives us the ability to uh, use the intelligence that comes from big data and, and data insights. And it also gives us Trust, because we're not just, Microsoft and Office 365 is not just supporting one, it's supporting multiple uh, ecosystems. So right now I'm gonna play you a video. Um, it's a vision video, and if you've seen our older vision video for the user experience, this is one that we are focused on the IT Pro experience. And what our North Star is to help people like yourself with operating in the cloud and what that looks like. Before I kind of talk about some of the innovations that we're doing. There's always something on the horizon. New changes, new challenges, and new opportunities. Skype for Business is changing the way IT delivers voice and video communications. You'll have a new way to deploy and scale communications for your entire organization. Hi. Did you see that they moved the broadcast up to tonight? Yeah, I saw it. Shouldn't be an issue. Our network's prepared for it. I do want to check out this uptick in Northeast mobile traffic. All right, I'm going to have help desk keep an eye on this one. The power to see the full picture from the entire business to a single user. Looks like adding new users there last week has increased their call volumes. Yeah, let's make sure we right size that segment. To harness unified communications data, and insights to keep your business on the leading edge. Imagine being backed by the world's largest enterprise cloud, from public cloud to hybrid solutions, with Microsoft as an extension of your IT. Your connection to the entire world, always on. Your communications at the highest quality. You'll be able to open a new office halfway across the world without ever getting on a plane, provision thousands of new users and devices easily, and get them all working in no time, all while spending less time managing your deployment. It comes down to greater visibility and control. With the world's largest enterprise cloud supporting you, data will become insights. Insights will become action. Hey guys. How is the New York site doing? Show me site utilization for New York. Who are our heaviest users? Sort by role. Can I get a copy of that? Of course. Action will become the way you meet new challenges on the horizon. Welcome, Sydney. Thank you for joining us. Shall we jump right in? We and empower your business to do more.
So I get joy when I see that because my biggest pet peeve was waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning and looking at my phone to make sure that we hadn't had an incident, right? We all know that, that panic moment when we don't, we don't know what's going on and we want to. And one of the things that we're now getting the capability to do with this global ecosystem, this big data, is that we're now able to start to bring some insights and some capabilities that didn't exist before. Now, who here would really want to be able to right size a segment in 30 seconds, right? We'd all want to be able to not have to call the telco, wait for you know, three and a half months for them to finally come around and say, yeah, we'll upgrade that segment, but you know, we've got different, you know, your BGP tables have to be updated, right? So the, the fact that we want to aspire to be at that point, and not, that's not that far off. Our ability to see that a segment base or, or a segment or an office is having poor call quality is very real. And I'll show you some stuff that we're landing in the next couple weeks in preview that really will help to really show you what that means around a lot of those analytics. But one of the things I really like to talk about is we are a global provider. Okay? And I'll show you in a second, you're going to see the map of where we actually have the capability of delivering services locally from data centers regionally. Okay? So, you know, Office 365, it's everywhere. Online meetings, everywhere. Okay? Cloud PBX, it's available everywhere. Everybody says, well, you got Cloud PBX. How is it available everywhere if you only have PST and calling in five countries? Because we enable the Cloud Connector Edition and Skype for Business Server to do that on-prem PST and connectivity. We have the capabilities as well for our dial-in and over 90 things. And I just noticed a typo. It's not US and UK. It's US, Puerto Rico, UK, and France with Spain in preview. In a year, we've gone after those countries. In the, in the PSTN conferencing, we are in the largest footprint for PSTN conferencing out there. Look at the providers that are out there. We provide in 90 countries in over 400 cities that we do dial in. Okay? And we're constantly adding. Okay? It's interesting, in certain spaces, they're like, hey, I want this area code. Like, in, I'm not going to say here, because I don't know uh, Chicago well enough, but 212, New York, everybody wants a 212. Except the banks have all eaten up the 212s for decades, right? Like, all of the businesses have had that. So we'll be able to provide the area codes in those regions and give you that capability to, to really be able to, to connect to either your carrier or us. But how many people here again said they were a global company? Okay, I saw more handers than that before. So um, one of the biggest challenges was if you're on-prem, you could build a pool in any region and deliver services from that region. If you were in Office 365 and Skype for Business online, you were hosted in a single region. So if you happen to be a multinational company with offices in EMEA, APAC, and the US, and your billing address was in the US, you were based in NOAM, in the North American tenant. Okay? Now, the challenge with that is, is that if you've got users that are scheduling meetings in APAC, they're traversing all the way across the Pacific and back for every meeting. We know that 89% of meetings for global companies happen within the region of the organizer. So I live in Tokyo. Most of my meetings are going to be hosted with people that are within the, Tokyo, within the APAC region. However, we are landing, and it's in preview right now, and it'll be landing shortly, is the capability for a company to have their host users hosted in the region that they're located. So, if I have users in APAC, they will be hosted in APAC. If I have users in Australia, they will be, can be hosted in the Australian data center for Skype for Business. Now, this is a media thing. We call it regionally hosted meetings. The biggest reason for that is that that is where our largest quality improvement comes from is because I'm not having to traverse back and forth for my media quality. So if I take a look at this, and let's say 
I have offices around the world, but they're all coming back to North America, and my distribution is 70% of my users are around the world. It means 70% of the people would have a suboptimal experience. Now we're giving them the ability to have a reduced time on the internet for two reasons. One, they will be able to get onto the Microsoft network sooner because of proximity to data center, but also because of our peering relationships with ISPs. Okay. But the other piece to this is, is it means that now they will have better reliability. Has anybody had a conversation with somebody in Europe, or, or sorry, in Asia, where you get the 500 millisecond round trip? Okay, a couple people. Now imagine that you have not only that, but multiply it by two because everybody's doing that, okay? This is the first workload within Office 365 to do this. Uh, so our media will stay local. Users will be homed in the regional data center that they're in. Um, and it's just, an, it, this is a really, really key solution. Now one of the other things that was key is, I saw some people in here say that they were in hybrid. And moving users from on-prem to the cloud had to use a tool to migrate their meetings called the meeting migration tool. Anybody in the room use meeting migration tool? Yes. Anybody in the room not want to use meeting migration tool? Same hands go up, right? We actually have now built that into the Office 365 service. So if, you, if you're on Exchange Online and you move a user from on-prem to the cloud, it automatically updates their meetings. If they're Move it, if they're already in the cloud and you move them from North America to APAC, it's going to update their meeting coordinates as well and send those updates to every single person that's on their list for all future ones. This is where we talk about bringing the innovation into the cloud. I can't do that at your on-prem exchange level because I don't have permissions to be able to update those coordinates. But the cloud brings some of those powerful things. So we've taken what we had in the meeting migration tool and built it into automation within the cloud and, and really the driver behind that was, we know we're gonna see a lot of users move from one region to another and making sure that all those coordinates are up to date so that IT pros don't have to go and hound their end users to try to do this. Because we know only about 20% of people will actually run that meeting migration tool or any tool we actually tell them, right? So our multi-region support and where this lands. So where you see the blue circles is where we actually have data centers and actually in the deck that will go live after the event, I will actually incorporate the link for the, the Azure website that shows you where Office 365 data centers are by workload. So that you can see, hey, in APAC, where I've got this big one down here, obviously um, the red is China, which is operated by 21 Vianet. But I've got a data center for Skype for Business in Hong Kong and Singapore. So you'll want to be able to know that, and so you can actually do that because you can set your preferred data locations. Ironically, it's not data, it's users, driven by Azure AD to then move your users into the region that you want them in, right? So for me, if I happen to be Canadian and I want to be in the Canadian data center, I can, right? Like if I'm living in Toronto. Now, PSTN conferencing, I talked about this. The dark blue on this is our coverage map. Um, now, one of the things that, that's there is that you can buy it in 64 countries. It's in over 90 countries for usage, but that's local dial-in. That doesn't mean that you can't dial into any other location that's there if we don't happen to hit one of your unique locations. But we have the majority of the coverage of most tier, most tier one, tier two countries and we also know that we have the coverage of most of the conferencing requirements for, for enterprises. Okay. Now, I'm gonna talk a little bit about improved reporting, because I think this is where, remember we just watched that video and we talked about all the neat stuff that you can do, and you know, do you see that uptick in traffic? Do you see that we move the broadcast? The key to that is actually making it accessible. Anybody here who's ever had to deal with a QOE database and trying to build your own reports, <laughs> don't laugh too hard, Anthony, okay? Or building out CQD and then figuring out your subnets to do that, or truly understanding what the capabilities 
you have and what you need to look at is where the challenges come, and that's lived in the on-prem world. One of the things we did when we moved to the cloud was it gave us a great opportunity to look at greater depth in how we want to visualize data. Data visualization is the, one of the hottest topics across the board on every single tech channel I've ever seen. It doesn't matter if it's Skype for business, if it's payroll, if it's network utilization, or it's dynamics, uh, it's my analytics within Office 365 or Power BI, right? And one of the things we are actually dropping into making available in the, the coming weeks is additional visualizations for location enhanced reporting. So I'm gonna give myself a little plug. In two weeks or in 10 days, we will be doing a broadcast with Microsoft IT who was part of the generators that helped the product group get to this point to deliver this. And this is the ability to look not only at Wi-Fi versus wired, but also look at location by location and being able to drill into different elements within the call quality dashboard that help them identify true root cause analysis. Now this is great for finding root cause analysis. This is where your engineers or you know, your senior service managers are looking at it and really driving into service health and improvement. What happens on the individual level? Oh, it's on the back. Ah. One moment. Only because I want, to, want you to see it. Imagine the ability that you can go from macro to micro. So last year we acquired the technology from a, from a company that did this data visualization for on-prem, and we're porting it to the cloud. And one of the biggest pieces that's there is the ability that I can see an entire overlay of my entire ecosystem, users, devices, locations. But also at the same point, I can drill in on an individual end, in, end user from IT and know exactly what went wrong with the call. Somebody give me, has anybody in here gotten that call that typically it's an escalation that says, hey, I had this really poor call and it failed and I need to know what that detail was. And then you go and try to find it, right? And you work really hard to find it and then by the time you find it, the person's forgotten about it. This gives you that ability within minutes to be able to dive in, look at the call quality details, understand the hops they took, where was their poor call, what was their poor call rate, what, what created it? Was it jitter? Was it packet loss? Was it the fact that they were using their speaker and mics on their home Wi-Fi network? Right? And so we, one of the biggest pieces about this is creating joy for IT pros. And so this is actually going to go into preview uh, probably at the end of this month or early next. And that'll give you the ability, if you're running PSTN calling or PSTN conferencing, it'll give you the ability to truly look into meetings, see the health of the meetings, see who was there. Um, I don't know if any of you have attended our previous events, but my colleague Jamie Stark uh, and I do that broadcast, but we, he tends to be the one that's standing on stage talking to people. Um, we had a call when we were doing, early on we were doing the multi, uh, the uh, regionally hosted meetings, so multinational, multi-region, and they'd homed me in Europe for a demo at Ignite, and then never moved me back. So I was now doing round trips for all my meetings, which wasn't bad. But what it did is early on, it gave, me an it gave us an opportunity to take a look at this and truly identify long before it ever went to production a bug around how we route calls. And so we were able to address that right away. Now imagine having that insight to be able to identify issues proactively and have proactive insights rather than reactive because somebody just called you. You start seeing a trend in poor calls on the CQD, you can dive in and identify key pieces. And the advanced analytics will tie in directly with that. So let's talk a little bit about how and when. We've got about 10 minutes. Um, our philosophy is, is it's, your, it's your choice. 
Do we all want you in the cloud? Yes. Why? We think you're going to get better innovation. We think it's going to do, uh, align with the paradigm shift that's happening in IT, which goes from bits and bytes and spindles and servers to service management and a, a, a circle of influence and working across teams. But also, one of the biggest things is not every organization is created equal. Some will require, for regulatory reasons, for the near future to stay on-prem. Some smaller organizations are like, I don't want to have to deal with anything on-prem, and I'm going to go 100% to the cloud. But a lot, a lot of the enterprises are going to make that journey over time, and it's going to involve hybrid. So the key that I'm going to give you is, is regardless of your state, you can start your migration. It could be as simple as getting your Azure AD set up and starting to take advantage of broadcast meetings. Because if you're on-prem, you can still use the broadcast meetings as long as you have rights to the cloud. You want to start with meetings and IM. And the reason that those are is because people that are using meetings and instant messaging will actually see an improved performance. And the reason is, is and I'm not, that's not for everybody, but it, the reason is, is that we manage the load balancers, the firewalls, the, the permissions, the gateways, all of the heavy lifting that is done to manage a link or Skype for business ecosystem is done by the guys that actually built it and then deployed it for the last 10 years. So they know what to look for. They have, they're monitoring it constantly. The, moving to voice is a different story. We're gonna talk a little bit about that in a second. Hybrid, uh, hybrid is part of your migration strategy. If I take a look at Cloud PBX, in most organizations, the feature and functionality that's in Cloud PBX, you'll see that in a second, will actually allow the majority of users within a company that require a phone number to move to Cloud PBX. There are always users in unique scenarios, contact centers or call flows, workflows, line of business applications that, that can't move. But we know that information workers use the same six feature functions that we all use that most of them exist on our cell phone. Um, and then understanding those dependencies and talking a lot about fast track and Skype operations framework. Later today, I'm actually going to give a session on Skype operations framework, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But how do you mi migrate? You, you look at your dependencies, right? If you've already done enterprise voice on 2013 or Skype for Business Server, you've done a lot of the heavy lifting. So moving those users right away, you gotta start planning for what's the right move. However, if you're running a 2010 environment and all of your users are basically using it for IM and presence and you wanna move to meetings and you wanna move to voice, great. That's an easy connect them to migrate the users, get their contact lists over, bring down the 2010 environment, and then start looking at what you wanna do for meetings and voice and enabling them for additional uses. The next piece, though, is that PSTN conferencing, right? Because when you enable them for PSTN conferencing, you've now expanded that meetings portfolio to basically cover almost all scenarios that a person would need within a meeting. And actually, what we're finding is more companies, now that you don't walk into your office and there's a phone on every single desk, more people aren't needing a DID because they're not needing people calling them inbound because they're hosting internal meetings with people that are in the company. and so enabling them for PSTN conferencing is much more common because we all used to go to school, go to work, and our parents went to work, and they walked in, and there was a desk on their phone. And the reason was is that's how they communicated with everybody. Now, most people that are, that are not most, I should say, some of the people that are in an in a IC role don't need to communicate outside the company, and if they do, most of it's personal, and so they use their cell phone. This isn't an all, but it is actually very common that we're actually seeing more people move from giving everybody a desk phone to actually giving them conference call capabilities. Yeah. And then the last is obviously enabling voice. And if you, there was only a few telephony guys in here, but building that telephony plan is, a, is, is it's a personal and very passionate ecosystem. And people have a, uh, depending on the demographic, have a very tight relationship with that phone, okay? So as they start to look at 
uh, at telephony and at voice, it becomes a much longer planned out conversation to really understand the dependencies of your users and your ecosystem. So, modern voice. You don't need to take pictures. I'm just, this will be in the deck available afterwards. But really is to talk about how our goal is to get you to the ability to be able to do cloud voice, right? To continually evolve and innovate. Our organizational auto tenant and call queues, we'll, I'll showcase some of that tomorrow, provisioning. But as you start to, to look at it, some of the advanced things like multi-line appearance or um, IP phone policies is common area phones. Anybody that's done Office 365 knows some of the challenges there. So just to kind of give you a, a little background on this, this will be available to really help you understand how do I plan for voice in the cloud? Now, Skype Operations Framework. Who here in the room knows what Skype Operations Framework is? Good, you got three hands, four hands, and one of them's a partner. <laughs> so Skype Operations Framework was a, is an end-to-end -end methodology that was devised because as you move to the cloud, partners and customers had a very strong understanding of how to do it when it was on-prem. Partners built practices and could deploy an on-prem Skype for Business ecosystem or Link 2013 ecosystem, rinse, wash, repeat. Yes, I got that right. <laughs> or wash, rinse, repeat, I guess. Um, but one of the pieces there, though, was we wanted to ensure that not only our partners in a cloud-first world had the assets to be able to go and be ready to move to the cloud, not only for net new deployment, but also what's cloud migration look like, but also then that we gave them the training and the assets available. And so Skype Operations Framework actually gives that end-to-end -end methodology with training aligned to it. And it's for customers and partners. And let me paint that picture a little bit. If you happen to be a very strong UC ecosystem and you've deployed 2010 and 2013 and you've moved to Skype for Business Server and now you're planning in the cloud and you've got a team Skype, for, Skype Operations Framework might be something that you would utilize, should be something that you would utilize if you were gonna do it yourself. Some organizations don't have the PMO or the discipline to understand all the steps, and so what we've done is we've actually taken Skype Operations Framework, brought it into our fast track process, which is our remote guidance for a customer to walk through the steps to do cloud migration and getting connected or getting deployed. But reality is, is that the majority of customers out there need a little bit of fast track with partners. And the reason is, is that it's a standardized practice, an end-to-end -end methodology, but what it also does is it really focuses on ensuring quality end-to-end, -end, understanding your entire ecosystem from the plan, the deliver, and the operate phases. So I'll be doing a session this afternoon on this if you want more details and I get into a lot of details of what we do. So what are your next steps? Well, in this case, if you're moving to the cloud, start with Fast Track. Fast Track, or, or talk to your account team to get you engaged with Fast Track. And the reason I say that is that it helps you start the process of building your success, success plan. It starts you on the path. And one of the things is they're gonna work you through the Skype Operations Framework, and if you get to a point where you're like, look, I need additional help, then they will reach out to a Skype Operations Framework partner to align that. And then really the other is, is really to uh, focus to ensure that your infrastructure and your environment is, is ready, okay? Moving to the cloud is a very different concept. Before I could, let's say I have one office, all my stuff is sitting in a, in a data center or on-prem or, or remote, I only have to worry about that one connection. Now I'm having to take into account how my users are gonna connect, what's the LAN look like, what's my internet ingress and egress look like if I've got multiple sites. So really, the, your next steps on this are making sure that you get the right people in place from a partner or fast track or your team, and then really that you follow that Skype operations framework to ensure your infrastructure is ready so that you have the highest quality when you deploy. And I'm supposed to remind you, we have an Ask the Expert session tonight from six to seven in the main hall. Come on by, and uh, I think I'm within a minute. Thank you guys, hope it was helpful.